Income tax, 2023-2024. Depreciation, timing, and method. Get ready and some coffee because we're looking at some useful hacks for income tax preparation. Hey, hey, I said useful hacks. Get that mainstream of sewage media reporter hack off the screen for crying out loud. This is serious. We're not here telling tall tales about how the president's uncle was eaten by like cannibals or anything. This is first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six pack shirts. A must have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape, which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. And, and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 946, how to depreciate property, section 179, deduction, special depreciation, allowing makers, listed property, and more tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements have an income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The Schedule C sole proprietorship form flowing into line one income of the formula. Noting that the Schedule C itself is basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses which you could call business deductions resulting in in essence net business income the net business income rolling from schedule c to line one income of the formula this formula basically reflecting the calculation on page one of the form 1040 we see here schedule c rolling into line number eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one additional income schedule c flowing into line three business income or loss from the schedule c this is the schedule c profit or loss from business having an income statement or p l profit and loss format income minus expenses the expenses being in essence business deductions and typically having the most different kind of categories some of those expenses being more difficult to calculate than others such as for example depreciation all right so when does depreciation begin and end now just a quick recap on the depreciation. Depreciation is a deviation from the normal a cash-based type system. So even if we were using a cash-based system, the IRS will typically require us to deviate from it when we have to put assets on the books as a depreciable asset, basically putting it on the balance sheet, which we don't have when we look at a Schedule C business, but we can't add a worksheet which is a depreciation worksheet listing the property and giving the related depreciation and accumulated uh, depreciation. The idea being we're going to put it on the books as an asset and then depreciate it over its useful life. All right. So that means that when does depreciation begin and end? We can always compare this calculation of depreciation towards the easiest kind of calculation, which would be a straight line depreciation. That would be the most common sense 
first thing we would think about if we were trying to calculate depreciation. We'd say, okay, this thing costs $10,000. If I say that I'm going to have it for 10 years, I could depreciate it over 10 years. Maybe I'll divide it by 10 and then depreciate it over that time. But when I first buy the property, I have an issue of when do I want to start that cutoff period at the beginning? Do I want to start it like in, in the day that I bought it or possibly in the middle of the month might be easy to calculate or possibly in the middle of the year, for example, might be easier to calculate. So when does depreciation begin and end? You begin to depreciate your property when you place it in service for use in your trade or business or for the production of income. So when you buy the property, uh, usually the idea would be you're going to accumulate the costs until it starts to get in process and so that you can use it. So if you buy a piece of equipment, when they ship it to you and you receive it, you're going to put it in service. You would think you'd start depreciating it basically when you bought it. But if you had to buy the piece of equipment and then go through an installation process and so on and so forth, all the costs of that installation you would think would also be capitalized as part of the equipment because that's what you needed to do to get it in service ready then to start using at which point you would think you would start depreciating it when you're using it to help generate revenue in the business. You stop depreciating property either when you have fully recovered your cost or other basis or when you retire it from service, whichever happens first. So in other words, if the thing costs $10,000, whatever depreciation method we have to use or choose to use within the law of the tax code, once we depreciate $10,000 worth of it, that basically means that we've taken the basis, which we couldn't write off when we got it because they forced us to put it on the books as an asset. And then we got the deduction related to that $10,000 write off over the useful life. Once we've written off $10,000, the depreciation ends because I can't depreciate more than the cost of the property. That's the point. We're allocating the cost. We're allocating the depreciation over the useful life as opposed to taking it in the first period. Now, if I dispose of the property before it's totally depreciated, then I'm going to have to deal with a possible gain or loss situation at the point that I dispose of it because I'm going to basically get rid of it. Maybe it's useless. I scrap it or whatever. Then I'll still have to take it off the depreciation schedules, but it won't be fully depreciated. And you would think that I would, I would possibly, I'd have to deal with the fact that it's not fully depreciated at that point in time, or I might have sold it, in which case I might end up with a gain, which is quite likely in the event that we over depreciate which is the case oftentimes these days because of the accelerated depreciation methods used, 179 deductions and so on. All right, placed in service. So you place property in service when it is ready and available for a specific use, whether in a business activity, an income producing activity, a tax exempt activity, or a personal activity. Even if you are not using the property, it is in service when it is ready and available for its specific use. So meaning obviously when you're buying something, you're, you're typically going to be using it. If I bought a forklift, I bought it to basically move stuff around. Once I have it ready, it's all set up. It's ready to go. Maybe I haven't moved anything yet, although I've been excited about getting this forklift. So I probably am going to start moving stuff right when I get it. But even if I hadn't, if it's ready to go, then you would think uh, that, that I could start depreciating it at that time. Remembering that if you bought the forklift to resell it, then you would be in the business of buying and selling forklifts, right? And that means it might be inventory. But if you're buying it to use it, then once it's ready to use, you would think it would be on the books as an asset and then depreciating it. Example, you bought a machine for your business. The machine was delivered last year. However, it was not installed and operational until this year. It is considered placed in service this year. So if the machine had been ready and available for use when it was delivered it would be considered placed in service last year even if it was not actually used until this year so let's say you you got sent a special freezer or something like that they sent you the freezer in december of the prior year 
but you didn't have it installed. It wasn't ready to use, right? And then you had to install it and had maintenance to get the freezer up and running because you run an ice cream business or something. Well, then that installation process you would think would be part of possibly the capitalization of the freezer because you needed to do that to get the freezer up and running for use. It wasn't a maintenance thing <clears throat> to install the freezer. That was the part of the first initial cost to get the property up and running, therefore possibly capitalized as opposed to depreciating that bit. Example number two, on April 6, Sue Thorne bought a house to use as residential rental property. Sue made several uh, repairs and had it ready for rent July 5th. So at that time, Sue began to advertise it for rent in the local newspaper. The house is considered placed in service in uh, July when it was ready and available for rent. So here we have a situation where real estate often having confusing situations with real estate because you could be producing real estate, which makes it a little bit more confusing to see when you're gonna capitalize things and stuff like that, if you're building things and whatnot. And obviously when you rent the place out, then it's available uh, at a certain point in time, but there was a lot of prep work to go in to get it to be available for that point in time. So the house is considered place in service in July when it was ready and available for rent. Uh, Sue can begin to depreciate it in July. All right, example three, James Elm is a building contractor who specializes in construction office buildings. So here we have this again. Now we have the contractor, often a confusing situation with the real estate because if you build buildings, then of course you have a long, a long period of time that you're putting labor into something that's basically being capitalized you know, as an asset, everything that's going into it, you would think would be part of the cost of the building as you're building it. So James bought a truck last year that had had to be modified to lift materials to second story levels. All right, the installation of the lifting equipment equipment was completed and James accepted delivery of the of the modified truck on January 10th of this year. So the truck was placed in service on January 10th the date it was ready and available to perform the function for which it was bought. All right, conversion to business use. So clearly it's, it's usually kind of a little bit easier if we start a new business and we buy stuff for the business. So if I bought a forklift for the business, it's pretty clear that, that the forklift is for the business. That's why I'm going to be using it. It has a business use for it. There could be some confusion about if I took a loan out for it in which case we would still have the cost of the equipment that would be depreciated and then we would have to deal with the loan, a liability, the interest related to the loan possibly being deductible. But if we have personal use that we convert to business use, that can be a little bit more confusing uh, to deal with. And this is a common thing that could happen with like a home, for example, a home office is, is an issue as well as a car is often an issue with regards to, okay, it was a personal and now I'm using it at least partially for business, for example. So if you place property in service in a personal activity, you cannot claim uh, depreciation. So, and this would be like if you had a home, for example, you don't depreciate your home, even though it does go down in value, it depreciates in, in the fact that it will deteriorate over time, the value of the, actual building will go down even the, the property value hopefully goes up just due to the to the location and so on but if it was a building that was an office building then because it, you have it in order to help you generate revenue in the future that's when you think we would think it might be a depreciable item however if you change the property's use to use in a business or income producing activity, then you can begin to depreciate it at the time of the change. So you place the property in service in the business or income producing activity on the date of the change. Now, the problem with that is another issue that happens is, well, what's the value of the property when I transfer it from personal to business use? because you didn't buy the property. If I've transferred my car, for example, or my, my truck went from personal to business, well, I didn't just buy the truck, so I don't know exactly what the market value is. And it's not like I kind of sold the truck to myself, 
So I so that so that becomes one of the issues that you have to basically kind of deal with uh, with regards to valuation. But in theory, of course, it makes sense because we're trying to keep the business separate from the personal. And if we transfer something from the personal to the business, then we'd put it on the business books and we wouldn't deduct it up front typically, but rather if it's equipment, put it on the books as an asset, just like if we bought it and then depreciate it over time. All right, example, you bought a home and use it as your personal home several years before you converted it to rental property. So this is kind of a common, a common thing oftentimes uh, with regards to homes, you have all these complex uh, regulations with homes. I won't go into a lot of detail with them now, but if you had multiple pieces of property, then you might switch between the property being, for example, rental and your principal residence. And one of the things with the principal residence is that if you sold it and it qualified as your principal residence, you might get this huge exemption from a gain, which could be quite useful. But obviously when it's rental property, the benefit on the rental property side of things is that that you could possibly deduct uh, items for for the use of the home as basically kind of like an income statement, although you could be restricted from things like passive activity losses. So having homes or property switch from personal to business use or having some combination can get somewhat confusing in terms of how to actually deal with them as well as from a tax planning strategy, something that will typically come up more in well-off or wealthy individual situations. All right, you bought a home and use it as your personal home several years before you converted it to rental property. So although its specific use was personal and no depreciation was allowed, you placed the home in service when you began using it uh, as your home. So you can begin to claim the depreciation in the year you converted it to rental property because it's used changed to an income producing use at that time. So then that makes sense, of course, right now it went from personal to business. Logistically, you could have some issues with that, right? Which is of course, what's gonna be the value of the home at the point in time it was converted from uh, uh, personal to business and so on. But I won't get too, too into the weeds on that right now. Idle property. Uh, continue to claim uh, a depreciation for depreciation on property used in your business or for the production of income, even it, if it is temporary idle, not in use. So obviously, if we have a piece of property we were using, but for whatever reason, we don't have a use for it at this point in time, it is now idle, but it was used, meaning it's not in use currently, but it was bought for business purposes you would think you'd still be depreciating it. For example, if you stop using a machine because there is a temporary lack in a market for a product made with that machine, continue to deduct depreciation on the machine. So this kind of makes sense, but you, for some people it might be counterintuitive because you might think that if I buy the machine, I should be depreciating, for example, if, if I buy a car, you might think I should depreciate by how many miles I drive because that's going to be the wear and tear on the car. But usually we calculate depreciation based on the time that has passed. And even if you stopped using the car for a while because you still don't need it for that particular time frame because you're not visiting clients for whatever reason certain, during a ter certain time frame, COVID happened or something, then you'd still the car would still deteriorate in value and if it, was a, if it was a purely business use thing, then you would think you'd still depreciate it as a cost of the business, right? Even though it's not currently, okay. Cost or other basis fully recovered. So you stop depreciation property uh, when you have fully recovered your cost or other basis. Meaning if I bought the thing for $10,000 and I fully depreciated it, it's been depreciated $10,000, not in year one, but over the useful life of the property. I can't keep depreciating it because then I would get an expense greater than the cost that I paid for the car. So that wouldn't be right. That would, be, Iris isn't going to like that. The point is you get the deduction of 10,000, but you don't get it up front. You have to get it over a certain time frame. You can't get a $10,000 car and then depreciate it over 
over a longer period of time. No, you just allocate the 10,000 over some time frame, and then you got to stop depreciating it because the book value will then be zero. So you fully recover your basis uh, when your section 179 deduction allowed or allowable depreciation du deductions and salvage value, if applicable, equal the cost or investment in the property. So in other words, the 179 is kind of like a form of depreciation. <clears throat> so it'll allow you to basically depreciate more upfront. So again, the idea being once you have fully depreciated the item, then you can't keep depreciating it. So see what is the basis of your depreciation, depreciable property. We'll talk about that later. Uh, retired from service. So we're talking about the equipment, not us. So you stop depreciating property when you retire it from service, even if you have not fully recovered its costs or other basis, meaning you had the forklift, you had it on the books, let's say for seven years or whatever, three years have passed, the forklift is, is no longer, it's an obsolete forklift now, you got a new one, you retired the old forklift from service before it was fully depreciated, well, then you still need to take it off the books at that point in time, which means that you're, you're, if you like disposed of the forklift, then you would write off, you, it'd probably be a benefit because then you'd get the, you might be able to take a loss, right? You kind of treat it as a sale, meaning you didn't get any income or you might've got some scrap for it or something and you no longer have the forklift. So you might have a loss that you possibly write off at that point in time, but you don't further depreciate it after it's been disposed of. So you retire property from service when you permanently withdraw it from use in a trade or business or from use in the production of income because of any of the following events. You sell or exchange the property. So if you sell or exchange the property, it's likely that you might have a, a, a gain oftentimes because of over depreciation due to things like uh, upfront accelerated depreciation, 179 depreciation, but once sold, you take it off the books, recognize gain or loss at that time, and then you don't uh, depreciate it anymore. You convert the property to personal use. So that would be clearly it's not part of the business anymore. You'd still once again have to take it off the books uh, for business use at the point in time it has been converted to being personal use, keeping the personal and business separate. Uh, you abandoned the property. So you just left it somewhere. So you just ditched it, right? Well, that means again, you no longer have it. You should take it off the books. You can treat that kind of like you sold it in that uh, what's going to happen, it's going to come off the books, but the sales price is zero. If there was anything that wasn't fully depreciated, you would recognize possibly a loss at the point at that point in time, but not further depreciate it. So you transfer the property to the supplier to the supplies uh, or scrap account. So in essence, you scrapped it. So it's no longer a forklift. It's just scrap metal or something like that should be off the books. You would think as depreciable property and then converted to scrap. The property is destroyed. So same thing. So now instead of abandoning the forklift, you destroyed the forklift or it got destroyed or something. You can treat that somewhat like a sale again in that you might have zero sales price and then if it wasn't fully depreciated you might have a loss or you might have recovered insurance or something like that which would be a similar situation that you've got got some kind of payment in essence for it right you recovered some of the loss possibly